You are now listening to the Curtis King Podcast. Music producers, welcome to a new episode of the Curtis King Podcast. This is a podcast specifically for music producers, but for thinkers and creatives alike. We talk about all kinds of wide ranging topics dealing with music production, but also we put an extra emphasis on mental health. For those of you that are listening on the traditional podcast platforms, first and foremost, we want to say thank you for listening to this podcast. Um, we hope that you enjoy it. If you could give us a five star rating, give us some commentary based upon your experience with this podcast. If you enjoyed it, if you want to see a video format of this podcast, we do one every Monday, the same time that this podcast comes out every Monday at 7 a.m. Pacific time on my YouTube channel, Curtis King TV. So definitely go over there and join the community. It's a really great and creative and supportive community that I think you're going to really enjoy. So that being said, now that we got the intro out of the way, we definitely want to make sure we say thank you to our podcast sponsor, the folks at Voclia Doubler, who engine and power this podcast. We want to say thank you to them for sponsoring this season of the Curtis King podcast. Now, last week on the podcast, I started it off in a in a way where I basically paid homage to DMX and sent out positive energy, as I'm sure many of you have sent out positive energy, hoping that uh, this brother would pull through. At the time, he was on life support, and the news had just broke. It was really fresh at the time period, and um. Yeah, it's really unfortunate to hear. It's been a few days since, but or actually yesterday, I believe it was, um, that he passed away at the age of 50. So we want to definitely say a rest in peace, rest in power to DMX, the legend. Um, one of the most passionate artists. We don't even just say rappers, because I feel like when rappers pass away, they automatically just try to I guess I'm going to make up a new word, legifyus, legendfyus, in a box, right? They only want us to be legends in the box of hip hop when it's like, no, you don't have an impact as large as some of the artists that have passed away, especially within the last three years. Um, but you don't have as big of an impact as a DMX in the culture of just music in general. And then you just put them as a hip hop legend. Yes, they are a hip hop legend. But wide ranging across all genres, there was a time period where this man filled such a void for which we're going to talk about today. The, the void of passion that is always a necessity. Right. He filled such a void that there was no MTV news without him being involved, like the 99, 98 era. And before then, he was already dominating with the Rough Riders. But even after that. There was a certain pocket of time where he just he was that guy. There was no there was no denying it. It wasn't no debate. He was that guy. And I feel like if maybe you're a younger member of my audience and maybe you weren't uh, there to see some of these things at an age where you were able to recognize what was going on. I would say the first thing to go check out is a 44, 44 minute video right now on YouTube that is um, DMX at the Woodstock 1999, I believe in Poland. Uh, you definitely want to check that out. It's, I think that'll give you an idea of just how massive, because that audience was so hugely massive and not just by the numbers, but by the impact that music like his has. This dude is from New York, from NY, right? But yet his lyrics, the X, everything that he stood for was understood in different countries by folks who don't always understand, you know, the subtle nuances and the slang and the language beneath what he's saying, right? The references he's making, how is it that they're able to identify with that and not only identify with that, but feel so passionate about it that they tat it on their arms, right? They got tattoos of him or tattoos of the lyrics 
or it's just something, even when it's hard to for them to express that in the same language that he raps in, they can still, you can see it in their face. You can see it in the way that talk about an artist. I remember Tupac, it's the same exact thing. Tupac, I feel like is one of those artists in which it's not always so much about what they're saying as much as it is how they say it. And it's a universal language within passion. Passion. My friend Noah James always says, passion always wins. In a world or an industry, specifically in hip hop right now, where it feels like you don't see that many artists that are like passion's not cool for a lot of artists. Passion for a lot of artists seems like, oh, it's not that deep. It seems to be the, the mentality behind, oh, it's not that deep. Life is not that deep. Oh, man, get out of here with all that struggle rap. Get out of here with all that, that conscious rap. Get out of yeah, whatever. Yeah, we, we, we just trying to live it up. We, trying, we need some escapism. And be that as it may, because there's always an audience that is there for some escapism, because I know a lot of folks feel a certain way about passionate music in that, you know, sometimes it cuts too deeply. It, it taps too close to home. And some people just want to get away. I have my times where I just want to get away. But one thing that cannot be denied, and I think DMX is a staple, he is, a, he is a, an icon, a great example, one of the greatest examples of passion always winning, is that passion will always find its way into the mainstream. It will always find its way. Someone will come along. They don't come along often. But someone will come along every so many years that will show you the difference between somebody who's really good at it, somebody who can collect a lot of people doing what they're doing, and somebody who you could put a thousand blankets around them and you could not dim their light because their passion is just something that just it boils out of them. It's a part of their DNA. They can't help but be anyone else. And sometimes that can appear as a character flaw, but they embrace that. They're unapologetically them, right? And I think that that is something that I appreciate DMX so much for. But I do believe, and I didn't want to talk about this in the day that he passed away because I felt like it was in bad taste to make it about anything else except for celebrating his brother and his life, right? But one thing I do think needs to be talked about that I feel does not, is not brought up enough, especially in the era of cancellation and canceling people, right? You get people who get canceled for something they said in 2012, something they said in 2009, and it's 2021 right now as I'm releasing this. You get people who get canceled for all kinds of reasons. But yet, as we're told by these artists, before they pass away, before they leave the industry, as we're told by these artists, these strong human beings, these passionate human beings, these folks that have a platform and, and, and want to help people, as we're told over and over and over and over again about the evils of the industry, it blows my mind that you never hear about the same industry, the folks that run this industry or the folks that are heads of certain labels or whatever the case may be that cause these artists so much extra stress, right? And even beyond causing them stress, you don't hear about how they're alleviating the stress in their years after they have reached their prime. Yet we never hear about these folks getting canceled. We never hear about exec names or A&Rs or whatever, whoever's in charge of that. I'm not in that industry. That's why I feel freely to talk about it. I'm not in that industry. And it's not my job to try to bring down an industry. I'm not, that's, that's beyond me. That's somebody else's job. But as a fan of the human beings that these people are first, even though I have not had an opportunity, I didn't have an opportunity to meet DMX. I saw him perform live a few times. It was a complete honor to see that, right? It, 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 it's one of those things where it's like, yo, what is it that is going on in the industry? And I feel like Dave Chappelle asks the same question. What is it about even the movie industry that takes these very 
creative human beings, these strong willed human beings, these folks that that just have strength that that it connects people. Right. It instantly resonates people who have the ability to be unapologetically them. What is it about this industry? That breaks them down. And I cannot speak from experience in terms of being that deep into it. I know everybody has their theories. There's a million and one videos on YouTube about theories about that. It's not what I'm here to talk about or even to debate. But what I'm here to say is that one thing that cannot be denied is that we continue to see the same story over and over and over again. Right. And it happens to so many artists in their later years when the mainstream has shifted their focus and it's sort of like franchise an artist, right? So in basketball terms, when a player gets franchised, it's it's basically like, you know, you you are you are part of this team, right? There's some there's some contract uh uh terminology that basically kind of puts the arm around the player. Like you're here, you're franchised, you're with us. Like we're gonna match whatever deal somebody else throw on the table, you're here with us. And I feel like that's what happens in hip hop culture. Certain artists have made such a tremendous impact. They get franchised. And then it's like, yeah, even if you're not making current number one singles, like a 50 cent, 50 cent has not been on the billboard charts in, in years on a consistent basis, but he's still somebody that's like, yeah, right. Like you, you are part of this, of this lineage. You are part of, of 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 the history of this because of the impact that you made and are still making even on a business end. There's certain folks you just get kind of grandfathered in, I think is another term for it as well. And so DMX is obviously a legend, obviously a goat in this, but I it 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 bothers me. It bothers me not even as just a producer, but as a fan of these artists. The tremendous stress that they have gone through the tremendous stress that they are going through, because in the midst of all this, you see a video from Black Rob, who is of that same era, a little bit, a little bit later after after DMX, but of that same era of hip hop, where he's in a hospital bed, and and he's going through through you know I don't know exactly what's going on with the, with him and, and and what's going on with his body, but he's going through some ailments that had him in a really vulnerable position, uh, you know talking on video about him sending his positive energy to DMX, but him also being in a position where we need to be sending him prayers. Now, today I saw a video on, on his Instagram because I was following him is he was discharged. But I think, you know, um, his team is saying that they're going to tell the fans what they can do to support. And let's not completely put this all on the industry, right? Because there's always two sides to the coin. A lot of artists, a lot of human beings make decisions that they must own up to that put them in these positions that sacrifice their body. And, you know, they went out and they said, I want to be a part of this. Right. I want my music to be out there. But I think it's too easy of a scapegoat to just say drugs are the reason. It's too easy of a scapegoat to just say, oh, it was the crew that they were with. It's the place that they were from. It's too easy to blame them. When the other side of it has side effects, when the industry has side effects. But the problem is this. You could blame the label. You could blame the industry at at whole. But there's no faces attached to it. So it always ends up switching back to the artists. And in the midst of DMX fighting for his life. Things like this happen where the New York Post put out an article talking about all the houses that he lost over the years and all the financial issues that he was having and all the drug issues. Like, what are you making an article about that now for? We know why. We know exactly why. It's clickbait. It's going to get a lot of people talking. They're a controversial outlet. But it's like, that's what happened when you only point the blame to the artists. Now, the artists have to take responsibility for how they take care of their bodies. But there's not enough being talked about of what are the side effects of going through the industry? What are the side effects of dealing with the stress and the things that we don't get to see on this end as fans and listeners? What is the side effects of it? Where are the deep, the deep think pieces and the, and the, and the blog posts and the books 
that write about the trauma that these folks who come from very traumatic and very crazy environments, where's the think piece is talking about the trauma they go through in the industry, right? Where's that conversation at? Why is there nobody getting canceled there? You're canceling the wrong people. And these folks continuously pull from, pull artists from impoverished areas of, of, of the world, right? And, 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 and bring them up and take advantage and, 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 and give them some kind of an income for them to be in a better place, in a better position. And they recycle them like clockwork over and over and over again. New artist comes in, oop, new artist comes in, boop. Right. And they benefit off of it financially because a lot of the times they're owning the masters. A lot of the times they are still able to make even more money after the artist passes away. But we want to cancel an artist because they said something when they were 17 <laughs> and they're 37 now, 38, 42. They want to cancel them because of something they said when they were 17, 21. It's like. For what? And this is why I feel like there's contradictions even within the cancel culture and, 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 and how folks maneuver that. But that's a whole other conversation, a whole other topic for another time. But I feel like if we're going to talk about these artists and then say things like, cause I see it already in my timeline. I see, you know, when you run a search on Twitter, man, you know, we got to take care of be take better care of ourselves, which is a very true statement. We got to make sure we make wiser decisions, which is a very true statement. But I know that after when everything settles, right, and, and, and when most human beings go back to normal schedule programming, right, obviously not his family, who I send the most sincerest, sincerest prayers and positive energy to you. I think he has 17 kids. I send nothing but the most positive energy their way. And I think I even saw something today talking about Beyonce and, and Jay-Z. Uh, looking to, and I haven't confirmed this, but they're looking to purchase his masters for ten million and give them to his kids to eat off of for free. Which I mean, hats off to 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 Jay Z and, and B for that one because that's that's a tremendous tremendous gesture. But that doesn't happen for every artist that passes away. There are so many artists that they capture the attention, they capture the moment. And then are forgotten about and not just by not just by the fans, but by the very people who who were supposed to be partners in elevating their music career. Ah, what have you done for us lately? But yet those same companies will recoup after the part the artist passes away. Merchandise sales go crazy. Streaming goes through the roof. Two thousand to four thousand percent. Right. Somebody's eating off of that. But we don't discuss them. We want to focus in on, well, he had a troubled past and he had this and he had this and he had that and he had that. You cannot blame one and leave the other one without some kind of blame. There's a lot of artists that I'm sure if you had a real dialogue with, and I've had many real dialogues with artists that have done spectacularly well within the industry who were like, take a seat. I can tell you some things about this thing that um, it brings it brings me traumatic memories to even bring up. They don't even want to talk about it. But when they when they do talk about it, it looks like somebody who is shell shocked. It looks like somebody who has gone through. It looks like a form of PTSD when I see artists that are talking about the things that they had to endure. The financial burden that this loan from the label put on them, the unrealistic expectations they put on them to figure out something that wasn't their business model to begin with, but they were invited into a space to do something. So I, it, it, I hope that that same energy that we put towards shunning artists, judging artists, that same energy is put towards these. And I think now is the time to do that. I think that's why I feel more comfortable having a conversation like this, because, you know, most folks five, 10 years ago will be like, oh, man, it ain't they fall, man. You know, they, they, they just a bank. They just a business. They just man, they just doing it's business, never personal. No, 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 no. You're in the business of 
dealing music that is a representation of someone's personal life. It cannot just be business and nothing personal. Them being as personal about their music makes your business more lucrative. It's not just business. You want them to be personal. I think to a certain degree, and this may be where I put my full hat on, I think to a certain degree, this is me being conspiracy theorist, Curtis, I think to a certain degree, they want these artists to go through trials and tribulations. They want them to go and run their, their, their name through the dirt, and they want to be able to buy low so they can sell high. Right. I think a lot of folks look from the, from 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 higher ups will look and be like, damn, they're going through it. But we can clean that up. We can clean that up. Right. Send them to rehab. Get them to work with a few crazy producers. Get them to get them get, get them some really major features. And then, you know what? Get them a, 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 an interview on on Vlad or get them an interview on on Oprah. If we can get that, we we'll just get that. And then we'll clean that image right up. Put him on a few magazine covers and say he's back. And then that becomes their opportunity to sell high. It, 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 it's hard to ignore that. It's hard to ignore when you've seen the pattern so many different times. And so I think now, I think now is a time to start asking questions in directions we don't always ask them. We need to start asking the people who run this like, yo, 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 yo. Before you start giving me these tributes, right? Because nowadays fans are making their own tributes and they're 10 times better than the ones we see on these major networks. They're doing them on YouTube. Folks are making their own tributes in the, in the form of podcasts, right? It's time to now question that. It's time, not, it's time to question the folks that are already having their, it seems like a rollout plan ready. For how are we going to monetize the passing of this artist? I feel like they need to be said. I feel like they need to be said. These are things that are on my mind. It's the reason why I have a podcast. I feel like they need to be said. But I think even more important than that, what I want to talk about is two things. One, before we go to a commercial break. But one thing being, maybe let me see, which one do I want to start off with? Because I got a few here. We'll start off with this one. This makes more sense. My buddy Noah James always says, passion always wins. And that was a quote that always resonated with me because I understand what he means when he says that. Kendrick said in uh, the song King Kunta, the funk shall never die. Or there was an ad lib in a song that said the funk shall never die. That always resonated with me because it helped me to understand that the music of yesterday, the music that I grew up on, the music that my pops raised me on, the music that my grandfather raised me on, the music that my mom exposed me to, the music that resonated with me as a young man and resonated with them as young men and young women when it first came out, there's a reason why it bridges the gap between what my life experience is and what their life experience was at that point in time. There's a reason that that gap, there's a reason why it feels something or why I feel something. Right. I think a big piece of that is obviously the funk. The, the, the stank, the attention to the, the swing of the drums, the way that the bass, the live bass player, like strums certain notes and just gives it a certain twang. Right. The way that they run the the electric guitar through different types of distortions that just gives it this this airy feeling. Right. The 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 attention to the rows and how they warm up a beat and the way that they make the music feel, the way that the singer waits a few seconds in between lines to express how they feel. These are things that I don't know how I understood them at a younger age, but I said there's something about this that feels right. That's the funk, the way that an artist says something. Right. The the, the way that they can say a line and then just scat or just. Why, 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 why? What does that mean? And why do I feel like I know what that means? So the funk is something I think that obviously resonates. Even more so than that, passion. Passion, passion, passion. It is the reason why your great-grandmother, at this generation probably, your great-grandmother played the Isley Brothers, your grandmother plays the Isley Brothers, and your mother 
plays the Isley Brothers. They just had a versus battle versus Earth, Wind, and Fire. Another band that your great grandfather, right? Your grandfather and your father can resonate with it. The passion in the music. Listen to these singers, right? Listen to the way that they express the love that they feel, right? Listen to the way that, that, that they express a feeling that you can't really put into words, but you have to just sing it somehow, some way. Listen for the subtle changes in the music to help you really, really understand the energy of what's going on in that person's life, right? I think of songs like pictures in a photo album. And every time I make a song, I'm adding another picture to a photo album. And when I think about looking at my old photo albums as a kid, I don't know how I do, but somehow I can kind of remember certain things that I cannot give you any context to. I see a picture of me with cake on my face. And for some reason, these red overalls, right? I can, something about that I remember, the carpet, something about the carpet color I remember. And these are places that I haven't been since I was two years old. I'm 36 now. But there's something that just sticks with me. And I think it's the same thing with music. So for the producers out there, you're probably asking, okay, I get this in a song context. What about in a production contest? Context, excuse me. In a production context, passion still applies. As we think about the way that a producer composes their instrumental. As we think about the instruments that you choose to start off a beat, when you think about your favorite live performer, right, Travis Scott or whoever, whoever you're listening to as of right now, whoever you're, is your favorite, think about when you're watching a live show. And I, and, I, and I challenge you to do this. Go to a YouTube video of your favorite artist. Watch one of their live shows. Then notice how the first few notes of a song, they don't even got to say no lyrics. But the first few notes of a song and the crowd goes crazy. That is telling you a little bit something about the passion of the music that was created behind it. Right. When you're watching a childish Gambino and they're singing, he's singing, he's singing Red Bone. And at the end of it, it's up, but stay up, but stay up. And you're watching him and he's closing his eyes. The background singers are closing their eyes. And then the piano players going through it, going crazy through it. That is the passion I'm talking about. So many producers just want to make a hot beat. And you know what? Make your hot beat and go make your money. I'm not mad at that. I'm not going to ever downplay you for that. But if you want to have a career that's longer than a few years. Postman once said, he said, producers don't have careers longer than football players. If you want to have a career longer than a football player, you better find something to be passionate about. You better find something to be more passionate about than how do I do this 808 roll? Why do you want to do it? I don't know. It's pretty cool. You better get past pretty cool. Pretty cool is appealing when you're very young, right? It's a bunch of things like, yo, that's kind of lit. That's appealing when you're young. But you got to go past. It's kind of lit. You got to go past. Oh, that's, that's just hot. You got to go past that. What's beyond that? You better find passion. And I don't mean make others believe you're passionate. I mean, find something that just gives you goosebumps when you sit down to make a beat. Give yourself that experience and tell me you will not. I'm telling you right now, if you have not experienced that yet, when you find a thing musically that gives you goosebumps, you will never go back to making music the same way. Everything else will feel like junk food. It's like, I know I make a lot of food analogies on this podcast, but I don't care. I'm about to make another one. <laughs> it's like when, when you get soul food for the first time. You get you not even soul food, home cooked meal. Everybody can relate to a home cooked meal. You get a home cooked meal that somebody took their time with, that somebody added just a little bit of extra, a little butter, a little extra flavor into it, and you're like, damn, this smack, auntie. This is delicious. I'm like, I know. I, I made it with love. That is the difference between. You just having like a Twinkie or some, or some, or some Oreos, right? I got a, it's an Oreo flavor that I found that is bomb. It's with marshmallows in it, right? I know it ain't vegan, but still I have it. And I'm like, yo, this kind of smack, but it don't taste like no homemade cookies. 
it don't it, it it just don't it don't fit in your fingers the same way, right? You, you oh my god, what is this? What is it? It's just melting it. That's what I'm talking about is the experience. Once you experience something that you are passionate about, not only does it change the way that you look at music, not only does it change the way you make music, it changes the type of people that start to gravitate towards the music that you make. When we go back to DMX, that is part of what makes DMX so legendary. That is part of the reason why Nipsey, you see the poster up here, why Nipsey is so legendary. It's part of the reason why Tupac so legendary. People understood the passion, even when they didn't understand the words. Imagine that. Imagine, I remember, I remember Kendrick said it one time. He got a beat from the homie Tay Beast. And he, he, he tweeted back when he was tweet. <laughs> he don't tweet no more like that. Back when he was tweeting, he said, I just got a beat from Tay Beast that put me in tears. Damn. He heard a beat without words that put him in tears because of the memories or the, the, the ideas that it evoked. It tapped into something really special. You make music like that. And I'm not saying that's just like only conscious hip hop or boom bap. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that's any music that you are passionate about. I'm pretty sure there's been some trap beats that made Future say, hold up, give me five minutes. Hold up, give me five. I'm trying to do my Future voice. I can't do it. Probably a beat he heard that was like, yo, mask, mask on, mask on, like mask on. Like that, that probably would make me feel a certain way because it's a sample base. That beat just feels right. But you know the passion. Passion feels deliberate. It doesn't feel like you added a bunch of ass, random ass sounds because you thought it would be, oh, that'd be pretty lit. That'd be pretty lit. Passion feels like I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm about to make this something that nobody's going to be able to deny because it puts my imprint, my DNA, my blood, sweat, and tears in this. And when I put that out there, it don't matter what you say because I stand behind it and I love it. Are you creating that? And I'm not judging you if you're not, but I'm telling you, if you want to leave a legacy, if you care about anything that I'm talking about, some people just don't care. And I'm not talking to you. You and I don't have a lot in common. If you do not see or you do not feel music like that. Right. And this is just a hobby for you. You can cut out right now. But if this is something that you do feel something that you wake up to something that you can't clean up your studio without listening to. Something that gives you a feeling like your body's been nourished when you hear the right music. Something that gives you goosebumps when you hear a certain chord progression. If that's not the way that you're experiencing music, or if that is the way that you're ex experiencing music, I should say this. If that is the way that you're experiencing music, you understand the importance of it. And no matter what genre of music you make, no matter what you create, no matter what style, UK drill, Chicago drill, right? Atlanta trap, West Coast, West Coast up tempo, radio music. It does not matter what style it is. Passion always wins. It may not feel like it's going to always pay, but if you stay the course, if you continue doing what makes you great, you'll see it. You'll see it in due time. Passion always wins. Let's take a quick commercial break before we end this podcast out. Shout out to our sponsor, Voclia Doubler, which is turning your voice into a MIDI. Oh, man, you're going to love this if you haven't heard about this. Check this commercial out, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy that, and I'll see you in just a second. All right? Peace. The Curtis King Podcast is proudly sponsored by the Voclia Doubler. What is the Doubler? Well, I think better than telling you, I should show you. You trying to tell me I can use this microphone to make beats, to make melodies, to make chord progressions. I can use my voice. I'm all in. Pretty cool, right? Check this out. The Voclia Doubler represents the future of making music. The Voclia Doubler is a real-time voice recognition MIDI controller. It offers up a never-before-seen way to translate your musical ideas into reality using the one instrument you've been practicing since birth, your voice. 
Make more of the music you love without having to worry about how to get your ideas into your DAW. Before the doubler even sponsored this podcast, I picked it up just because I'm a geek about technology. And I personally picked up the doubler studio kit, which allows you to hum a melody, a synth pattern, or even beatbox one shots right into FPC if you use FL Studio or whatever DAW that you're using. This also allows you to manipulate effects and filters in a way that only the voice can. To get the Studio Doubler kit, all you got to do is access getdoubler.com forward slash Curtis King. Okay, thank you once again to our sponsor, Vocalia Doubler, that has powered this season of the Curtis King podcast. I want to end this podcast on a really positive note. Um, as we remember DMX, as we Think about some of the steps that he took to grab his independence as an artist. Remember, he was signing to like uh, a few labels that were kind of outside the box in, in his independence. But that was his pursuit at the end of his career. I think about even with Nipsey, I think about how important ownership and independence was to him. And I think about just how the entire movement of producers, and I'm so proud to see my producer community doing for themselves. I'm so proud to see so many of you that are trying to figure out, you know what? It may not be in my cards for a label to come scoop me up and turn me into a pop success. <laughs> I don't know what kind of Disney movies y'all watching. But I hope you've been paying attention to these movies that come out that tell you all the bullshit that these artists got to go. Through. Um, but. Yeah, hopefully you're not in that in that in that, in that bag anymore, but, you know, I, I, I'm so I just want to say I want to celebrate them first. I want to celebrate the producers that and the artists that look at independence as not like, well, I guess I just got to do this. They look at this as this is a part of my story. Some people I remember I remember years ago. They looked at their independent grind as not really a part of their story story. They felt like their story story didn't start until the mainstream knew who they were. Or they felt like it has like the hours or the, 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 the time doesn't really count. And they're not really on the clock until they're now on the radio or they're now on, you know, these major networks. And that's when it really started their career. Now. I'm seeing more and more artists that not only are embracing their independence but are maximizing their independence that are figuring out how to have an ad system on Facebook or Google or whatever they're using. They're figuring out ways to expand their business and not only expand their business because they want to maximize it, but also become a competitive source that makes them competition and makes them, I guess, sometimes affiliates for these other companies that used to look like they were on top of this mountain looking down on them. Now they have leveled the playing field simply by standing up for themselves, simply by trying to do it themselves and succeeding in that. And I want to talk right now to the producers and the artists that are on the fence. For those of you that have made it your duty, even after 2020, and you're like, yeah, I hear you, Curtis. I, yeah, I heard about all this stuff going on with the industry, yada, yada, yada. Like, I hear you. But I still want my stuff. I want my Grammys. I want this. I want that. By all means, do you. I will not try to discourage you from what you feel like your life should be about, what you're passionate about, because you ain't going to change my opinion about what I'm passionate about. So I would not even try to do that with you. I wish you the absolute best. I say the best investments you can make before you jump in that industry, invest into your mental health. Get, in, get into a room with a the therapist. Start to work on some of the trauma that you may have experienced. Start to work on some of those personality flaws that you have. And so you at least been exposed to it so that when you're challenged in this industry that is going to challenge your mental toughness, your physical toughness, your durability, you're at least prepared or more prepared when it is tested. That's just my suggestion to you. But for those of you that are on the fence, it, it, it's still kind of like it's crazy to me when I see folks that are asking me, me, <laughs> how to get into the industry. Right. Not because I don't have any great information for you to follow, but because you see my story, my story is an independent story. My story is a story of my story is a story of ownership, ownership of myself, ownership of my time, 
That's why I started selling beats first. I got to a place where no matter all the credits that I had, no matter all the folks that I was in the room with that I worked with, I was still just as broke or just a few steps above broke than I was when I first got into it. And then on top of that, it wasn't like I was a few steps above broke and I didn't have like <laughs> a, a, a imbalance of stress on top of that. No, my stress was significantly above that. Right. Because you get more money, more problems. So you're making a little bit of money. But guess what? Your overhead is just a little bit higher now, significantly higher because you got to make it look good. And if you ain't looking like you're making nobody, if you're not, if you don't look like in the industry, like you're making money. Who would want to invest money into you? Would you want to invest money into someone that looks like they're not going to make you your money back? It's bad investments, right? That's bad investment advice. Would you invest money into something? I think I saw that in a Russell Simmons book. He said, you can't put yourself in a position where you're looking for investors, but you don't look like you're going to make anybody any money. Then you're making yourself no money. So I understand the whole look and the, 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 the scenario with that. But it boggles my mind still to hear producers come to me and ask me. And I'm like, do you not, have you not been paying attention? Right? How you, <laughs> that's what we do. But then I had to realize with, with us doing content on a consistent basis, we get new people on a consistent basis. Got it. But I want to talk about last topic before we end this today because I think this is an important podcast episode. The biggest shift, and I wrote this down, the biggest shift in my independent music career came when I realized I would have to be my own machine and blow myself up. I think a lot of times, and I can speak for myself, I was on the fence of, I think I want some of these shiny things that the industry presents. I want this Grammy. I want this notoriety. I want this stardom. I want these multi-millions. I want, I want to have the number one record on back at then it was 106 in Park. I want to have all these things. I want everybody to know who I am. I want it, I want people to know that this journey I embarked on wasn't in vain. I want them to care, right? I want them to realize that I I was supposed to do this. I want to prove them wrong. I want to get all that and more. And then I looked at the other side like, well, I mean, but if it doesn't work out, I can always just, I guess, be independent. And it put me on the fence where it was like, but there's some benefits of independence, right? I can determine my own schedule. You know, it's really hard because it's a lot of more work, but I, I can do what kind of music I want to do. And OK, there's a few benefits. And so it put me on. Right. And, and also the money aspect. Let's not even talk about that. The money aspect, I'm, I'm recouping because I'm investing everything um, 100 percent. It kind of leaves you on the fence. But then there's always that other the shiny things, right? The shiny part of the industry, the people that you could work with that always kind of like pulls you in somehow, some way. And it's not even just the industry in that aspect, but also like corporations and companies that have the bread, have the moolah, right? Because it ain't the, 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 the labels and all that. They ain't always had the money to offer, right, to, to justify the time that I'm investing. But these companies, these major corporations, these, these folks that are like, yeah, we'll pay you 30 racks to do a commercial. Say what? <laughs> a one minute commercial, 30 racks. And this, it makes that side very appealing. And it put me on a fence because I was like, like, you know, I, this is guaranteed, right? Or kind of guaranteed if I can get the commercial, if I win the, you know, the contest between me and other producers, I mean, I could, I could get this, you know, and, and, and maybe, you know, when I get in there, shake a few hands and move my way up, that was always sort of like, yeah, that's alluring. And this independent side didn't seem like there was, you know, it seemed like there was potential, but I had to dedicate a lot of energy to make it work. And you can't do it all on your own, no matter what you're doing, you cannot do it all on your own. So it leaves you on the fence. But I cannot remember the point in time, but I can tell you the shift that happened within me. Because it wasn't something that there was like evidence on, on the, the independent side uh, that swayed my opinion, right? You know, perhaps it was when we went number four, number three, on the, uh, number four, number four on the iTunes charts twice. 
right, for the, the project I did with Oh Gosh Dale. It's called Jubilee Year and Somersault. When we did that two times and I saw our names above Drake and above J. Cole and above, you know, uh, Kendrick and all these folks that are up there. I was like, we did that independently. But that still wasn't the thing because I knew the system that I created, the strategy that I had to make it happen. It still didn't click for me. It didn't click for me that I'd have to do this on my own feet, on my own call, on my own planning, on my own money until I had a shift in my confidence. When I had a shift in my confidence that said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't have to do this because this is not working out the way that I planned. I want to do this. I don't. My personality type, and I know a lot of you are the same way. I don't like having to ask this person to ask this person to ask this person when I get paid. I don't like to, um, hey, man, just wanted to keep the contact warm and just, you know, see how you're feeling about the music I sent through. And OK, well, no, no worries. I know you guys are busy. I hate that felt weak, felt weak for me. Couldn't stand having to text rappers. Hey, bro, you still going to use that beat? Oh, oh, I forgot you sent that through. Oh, no worries. I've just been waiting for four months. That shit got so tiring. The hell I look like? My pops ain't raised no follower. Pops raised a leader. And I didn't feel like a leader in environments where I had to always rely upon someone else, a middleman, to tell me when I could move, when I could make decisions. That's not that's against my nature, but I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that until... I started to look around me, right, and start to kind of audit my environment and look and see, bro, you really took this from your grandmother's patio, created a six-figure business, right, pulled yourself out of multiple impoverished situations where you, you, you got a lot and then you lost it all. You got a lot, then you lost it all. But you're still taking risk. But you're still figuring out ways to pull yourself out of this. You're still constantly evolving. Most artists, producers, whatever, YouTubers, whatever you want to consider me, when they get to this stage of their career, most of them are slowing down, are thinking about, well, man, I'm getting up there in my 30s. Guess it's time to transition to something else. Not I, not I, not I. Right. Even NBA players, you look at it, you look at LeBron, they're so in awe of LeBron being 36 and still running on them legs and dunking and doing all the stuff he's doing. But I get it. I'm not saying I'm on the level of LeBron, but I get the tenacity. I get the, 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 the hunger of what has changed. I still want success. I learned more now at this age. I feel wiser. I still want this. And so I'm going to go out there and get it. I don't care what the, I don't care what the speedometer says. <laughs> I don't care what the age says above my head like I'm a Sims character. I don't care about none of that. What I care about is that I have set out goals and those goals shift every single year to to adjust to the to, to the to the lifestyle, to adjust to the new developments and create creative things that I have brought to the forefront. They shift. Right now we're thinking about plugins. When you constantly stay in motion and trying to think of ways to grow what you already have. One, you always have something to fight for, right? Or you always have something to work on. So that keeps you motivated. But then also it keeps you from worrying about what other people have. And I think that's a big, big, big piece of why so many producers and artists want the industry because they're thinking about somebody else that came from the same area as them or somebody that's their same age or, you know, makes the same kind of music that just blew up and got this deal and got this and got that. When you're busy, you don't have time to pay attention to that. Not because you're being a hater. Salute to them. But you got stuff on your to-do list to do. They have a business like you got a business. Right? Imagine Pizza Hut sitting around waiting to see the next move that Domino's is going to make. Right. Like what? <laughs> I'm sure there's marketing departments that focus on the competition. But that's the marketing department. That's not the CEO. That's not the one, the, the visionary, the one that had. That's not them. That's the folks who have been 
put in place to pay attention to what is going on in the market. As us, we're all that in one until we build our teams up. So where you assess your attention and time is so important. Make sure you're putting it towards something that's going to continually build what you already have. I don't care what level that's at. If you're starting off making beats, you are in the product development phase. Let me cut this music real quick. You are in the product development phase. So develop your product. So many folks get into this and they're already thinking about, yeah, I just started making beats two months ago and I'm already trying to think about my funnels. You don't need to be thinking about no funnels right now, fam. What is your product? What is the demand for your product? What is the void you're filling in the market? Not what you want it to be. What void are you filling in the market? If you don't have some void you're filling in the market, stop getting out here trying to make some goddamn funnels. <laughs> you, you don't need a funnel right now. You don't need a beat store right now. What you got to do is develop your product. See if it's something that people want to pay for for free. First of all, you can't give it away for free. What make you think you're going to sell that? Right. Leave your beats in the middle of the street. Nobody pick it up. That says a lot about what you got. But you need to know that you need to be the one that nobody can lie to. If, if, if everybody else want to lie, that's cool. Don't lie to yourself. Know where your beats are at. Know where your product is at. You're in the product development phase. Develop your product. But don't sit around here and, oh, man, well, if I had this, then da -da -da. no. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps where you're at. Make it work. Make it work. Leave yourself. That is the only difference between me and somebody else who's out there saying, man, you make it sound like it's easy. You, you got lucky. You work with certain people. And do you know when I started selling beats, they didn't care who I worked with? They didn't even see when I added my credits to the page. They didn't even care. They said the beats is fire. I had to prove myself to these new people. And you're going to forever have to do that. Even when you become, I remember seeing a video of Jay-Z on a train talking to, uh, he's on, he's on a, new, a New York train. And he's sitting by uh, this older white lady. And she's like, he has cameras around him. She's like, oh, are, are you like famous or something? Like, what do you do? He's like, oh, I, you know, I do some things. I make music and whatnot. Jay-Z! Who you think everybody knows, especially if you're in the hip hop culture. They didn't know who he was. You're going to forever, forever be selling yourself. Or proving yourself. Right? Somebody's going to forever see you for the first time. It's the same thing with TV shows and reruns. You watch a show for the first time. That's your first time seeing it. That show better be the best representation of that show. Or you're not going to watch it again. So. My encouragement to you, start digging now for whatever confidence is necessary for you to have a real dialogue in the mirror. As a producer, I want you to be able to look in the mirror right now and say, nobody's coming to save me. Nobody's coming to sign me. Nobody's going to give me a placement. No famous rapper is going to open their email up when I send it. Not because it's coming from a place of you not being confident. It's from a place of you realizing that you're not that special. The moment you realize you're not that special, you start to align yourself with the mindset of the greats. Kobe Bryant once said it. He said when he put up three air balls, I think it was 18. First year in the playoffs against the Utah Jazz. I think 1996. He threw up through air, three air balls. That could have demolished his whole self-confidence, and I'm pretty sure he did at the time. But he said he had to have a moment where he realized, look, 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 look. Other people have gone through far more embarrassing things. And guess what, bro? You're just not that important. <laughs> Chill out, right? Those three air balls did not crash the economy. Those three air balls did not put an entire team in debt, right? You didn't have to go bankrupt because of those, those three air balls. Chill out. I want for producers to stop thinking they're the exception to the rule. You're not that special. Neither am I. It's because I made a plug in. Don't make me no, don't make me no more special than anybody else. What makes me more special is the fact that I know my worth. And you can't tell me any other way. I know that and I stand on that. I'm confident in that. Because I've seen enough evidence for me to go back and pull from and say, damn, you did pull yourself up by your bootstraps there. You did. At some point, say, I don't have anything. I am nothing. 
I am just who I am. But it's not going to always be like that. Look in the mirror, have a real dialogue, really, really sit there and say, what would I do if I knew nobody was coming to save my situation? Well, let's start building piece by piece, brick by brick. Thank you for watching today's episode of the Curtis King podcast. Hopefully there were some things that you grabbed from here that were very valuable. Leave it in the comments if there's something that really, really resonated with you on the YouTube. Also, like I said before, if you're just on the traditional pl uh, pl uh, podcasting platforms, make sure to leave some commentary. Let the folks know the kind of stuff they can expect in here. I really and genuinely appreciate you being here and listening. It's just a microcosm of the things we talk about in here. Hopefully it resonated with you. For those of you that are interested in the plugins that I mentioned, please go to slapexperts.com. It'll lead you to all the plugins that we have. We have two out right now, Beat Timer and Tape Boy. Tape Boy plugin right now is going off crazy. I got to say thank you to everybody that's been supporting that. Much love to all y'all for doing that. And like I always say, in this life, you will not be full of life until you decide to live life to its fullest. Once again, it's Curtis King of the Curtis King Podcast. Shout out to Vaglia Doubler. Have a good one.